Well, hello everyone. Uh, it's great to join you, even if only remotely today for uh, this honors lecture uh, on the topic of freedom. Uh, my name is David Finnegan Hosey. Most of you probably already know me. I'm the college chaplain and director of campus ministries. And uh, I'm gonna be talking today uh, about, about freedom, obviously, and about freedom uh, through the lens of a thinker and a writer and a pastor uh, from a long time ago. Uh, someone who you might not necessarily associate uh, with the concept of freedom. Uh, before I get started, I just wanted to put this slide up really quick with my contact information uh, so that you can see that. I'm at chaplain at barton.edu, and then that's my scheduling link there, chaplaindfh.youcanbookme. And uh, uh, those are there. If you have questions or you're interested in any of the things that I bring up in this lecture, feel free to reach out to me. But also, I'm here as your chaplain, right? And so I'm here to talk. We are in the midst of a big global situation that uh, can be kind of scary and anxiety provoking and creating all sorts of different uh, ripple effect challenges in our lives. And so uh, if, if you need to talk about anything, just please feel free to reach out. I'm available uh, for you during this time, just like I always am. So with that said, my, uh, my talk today is called Up For Whatever, Paul, Freedom, and Meat Sacrifice to Idols. So I'm going to be talking today, like I said, about a thinker that uh, you might not associate uh, so much with the topic of freedom, and that's Paul. Um, oh, I'm so sorry. Uh, this is the wrong Paul. I am not talking about Paul Rudd today. He is iconic, but that is not who I meant. I'm so sorry. Okay, so I'm going to be talking today about Paul. Oh gosh, I'm so sorry. This is so embarrassing. Uh, I, I'm not talking about RuPaul today. Uh, she is also iconic, um, but uh, I'm talking to, here we go. Okay, I'm talking today about the Apostle Paul, uh, who you may have heard of. Um, he is an interpreter and a transmitter of early Christianity, right? And uh, if you're not very familiar with who this character of Paul is, if you were to take a Bible, uh, if you've got one in your house, or uh, you could go uh, find one online, like at biblegateway.com, right? And you were to be able to flip to the back of that Bible, what you would find is what the Christians call the New Testament. And most of that New Testament, the writings are going to be from this guy, Paul. So for example, we'll be talking today about First Corinthians, which was written by Paul in the first century, uh, common era. And what Paul did is Paul wrote letters. He wrote letters to churches and to leaders of churches. And Paul was kind of a remote pastor, which is something that's remarkably relevant right now uh, for me and for others in my profession, right? Paul pastored congregations uh, in cities across the Jewish and Hellenistic Greek Roman world uh, by, by sending them letters. Paul is often interpreted uh, through a really legalistic lens. So you might have heard of Paul as uh, someone as an author who talks a lot about like what you can and can't do. And uh, that's, I think, true. He's, it's true that he's interpreted that way, both from people who really like Paul and people who really hate Paul. They, see, they tend to see Paul through this legalistic lens. But actually, I'm gonna argue today, he writes with great care and nuance exactly about the topic of freedom. And uh, yes, he literally is iconic. There is an icon of him uh, from, the Russian or from a Russian Orthodox monastery. So <clears throat> we're gonna be talking about Paul. Gave you, you know, some really basic information about, about, about Paul, but when we talk about Paul's letters, there's a couple things you need to know in order to understand what's going on when we dive into, uh, into a particular letter, letter to look at it more closely. So the first thing to know is that Paul's letters are letters, right? They are, uh, they are correspondence. And we generally only have the letter that Paul wrote, but these are part of kind of a conversation, people writing letters back and forth to each other. Think about, say, pen pals, right? So that means that if we read a letter from Paul, we're only listening to one side of the conversation, right? It's like listening to one side of a phone call. We don't have the responses necessarily, although we'll see in 1 Corinthians that actually Paul is quoting from the letter that was written to him. We'll, we'll look at that in a minute. 
keep in mind, this is a letter relation to one side of a conversation. Second, we think of Paul as writing these letters, but that's actually probably not true. It's very likely that he was dictating these letters. And there's all sorts of ways we know that. If you're interested and uh, you wanna reach out to me, I can tell you more about how we know that. But you see this icon over on the side of the, side of the slide with Paul with this book, right? And that's anachronistic, right? He, the, for one thing, bound books didn't exist at, in the time of Paul in the first century common era, right? But, but also Paul wouldn't have been writing. He would have been dictating. He would have been talking to a scribe who is writing down the letter. <clears throat> and uh, that's really interesting because at times you can actually hear Paul talking his way through a difficult topic. Uh, you know, you'll hear me at times during this lecture, I'll, I'll say something and then I'll realize, oh, I didn't say that very well. I'll go back and I'll kind of correct what I just said, right? We all do this when we, when we speak. You'll hear Paul doing that in his letters. He's talking things through out loud as he, uh, as he dictates these letters. So that's interesting to keep in mind. And finally, the third thing to keep in mind, just like the rest of the Bible, whenever we're looking at uh, the, the Christian and Jewish scriptures, we're looking at old stuff, right? These are ancient documents. They were not written in English, right? They, they, so we're looking at translations, unless you happen to speak the original language. Um, you're looking at translations and the topics and the things that are being addressed are ancient. The, the, the hot topics that Paul has to address in his letters are not the same as the hot topics that we might have conflict about or argue about uh, in the modern era. <clears throat> but one of the things I'm gonna point us to uh, in this next 15 minutes or so is how sometimes these ancient topics that Paul is addressing that seem to have no relevance for us in the contemporary era are actually surprisingly meaningful and important um, when we get in kind of under them and, and find out what's really going on. So let's take a look. Here is a piece of Paul's letter to the church in Corinth. Okay, Corinth is a city in Greece. There is a church there, a very early church there. And here's what's happening in this letter. Actually, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take the screen off for just a second um, <clears throat> and uh, just give you some context first, right? The church in Corinth is a young church and they are fighting. They are in a lot of conflict. Um, many movements throughout Christian history, including the Disciples of Christ uh, that Barton College is affiliated with, right? Uh, have, have thought about what would it be like to return to the early church and to model our modern church off of the earliest of churches. And uh, if the letter to the Corinthians is any indication, actually the early church was a bit of a mess. The Corinthians are arguing about all sorts of different things. And so they have written, leaders of the church in Corinth have written to Paul and said, hey, Paul, you're our pastor. You're our remote pastor. We're fighting. We're in conflict. Help us out. We've got some controversial issues. Tell us what to do about these controversial issues. Now, at the same time, there's a faction in the church in Corinth that doesn't like Paul very much. They're annoyed by Paul. They're like, why are we writing to Paul about this? Paul's not actually good at writing. Paul's not good at speaking. Why do we have to listen to Paul? Well, Paul's got a buddy in Corinth who has come to him and has let him know about these mutterings about him that are going on in the church in Corinth. So he has both a letter from the leaders saying, hey, tell us what to do, and this rumor or this report that some people are saying bad stuff about him. So he's annoyed, okay? He's annoyed at the church in Corinth. And you can see throughout his letter, this kind of frustration coming through. And sometimes he's a little bit snarky and passive aggressive with him, which is great, right? It's like great drama. So they have written to him and they have asked him for his guidance on a bunch of issues. One of which Paul is responding to in this particular piece of the letter. He says, now concerning food sacrificed to idols. Now, you probably haven't spent a lot of time thinking about the ethics of eating food that has been sacrificed to idols. What does this even mean, right? What is this passage even about? Well, here's the deal. When you went to buy groceries in ancient Corinth, you went to an open air market. <clears throat> so you didn't go to the food lion. For you Florida folks out there, you didn't go to the Publix, right? You went to this big open air market. And when you entered the market, you know, just at the kind of same place where you'd get your grocery cart, you'd make a small sacrifice to the gods of the market, to the gods of the city and to Caesar, the Roman Empire who, or emperor who held sort of a godlike status, right? So you'd make your sacrifice. And you'd also, when you bought groceries, you might make a sacrifice of a small piece of what you were buying. So if you went to the market to buy meat, 
you would make a small sacrifice of that meat to the gods of the market. It's just what you did. It was the custom of the city. So there are um, two factions that are uh, uh, disagreeing about how the Christian community should handle the fact that when you went to the market in Corinth to buy your groceries, people were sacrificing things to idols. There is a group that says, look, we are Christians. We don't believe in these idols. We don't believe in these gods that people are sacrificing to. Therefore, we should abstain from eating any meat that has been sacrificed to these idols. Uh, to eat the meat would be idolatry. It would be a violation of our faith. And so the faithful thing is to refuse to eat meat. Even if we go over to, say, a neighbor's house and they've invited us over, um, we should tell them uh, we, want, we won't eat that meat because it's been uh, sacrificed in the market. There's another faction in Corinth, in the church, that says, no, no, the opposite is true. Because we're a Christian, we don't believe in these gods, we don't believe in these idols, we know they're not true. We know they're fake, they're not real, they're just statues, and so it doesn't matter. We can eat whatever we want. We are free to do what we want and to partake of whatever we want exactly because of our faith, because we know that our faith is, goes beyond uh, or is, is better than uh, these idols that people are sacrificing to. This might seem like a strange conflict to us today, but this was seriously dividing the church in Corinth. People were really fighting about this thing, and it, this was like the hot button controversial issue of the time. Okay? So, so that's what's happening here. That's what the fight is about that Paul is addressing in this part of the letter. Now, let me just point out a couple quick things in this passage. I won't read the whole thing, but a couple of quick things. You see these places where there's quotes. So Paul says, we know that all of us possess knowledge. Knowledge puffs up and love builds up. Those quotes, Paul is probably quoting from that letter that was sent to him by the Corinthian church. He's quoting them back at them, right? So we know that no idol in the world really exists and there is no God but one. These are arguments that the faction in Corinth who says we can eat whatever we want has been making. They're saying, because we know these idols aren't real, we can eat whatever we want. <clears throat> and so you see here, Paul is kind of responding uh, to this conundrum and he is trying to work through with them uh, some of the consequences of the decision uh, that they will, they will make. And here in this part of the passage, and we'll, we'll go on to look at a different part in a second, but, but he, he seems to be saying, um, we got to be careful what we do here because we might actually endanger the faith uh, of, of people who are, are new to this whole Christian thing, which would have been a lot of the members of the church, right? It's a young church. It's an early church. So this is dividing the church and Paul is trying to respond. So he has a pastoral conundrum right? He is, uh, he's a pastor. He's trying to pastor these people. Some of them have been frustrating him and they're writing to him, but they're talking about him behind his back and, and they, they can't decide which of these two factions is right. So Paul, as the pastor here, as the, the spiritual guide, right? He has to respond to them and he's got to take both of these concerns into account. Uh, one is a concern for freedom, right? And our faith sets us free to do what we, uh, what we want to do. And the other for holiness. No, no, we have to remain pure. We have to remain separate. We have to be different from the society around us. Um, so, you know, what is Paul going to say? What is he going to do? Okay. So look, again, this might seem like a very strange, very old, very out of touch argument. Nobody is arguing anymore about meat sacrifice to idols, right? But what I want to just point out is that these two factions that Paul is dealing with and the philosophies behind those two factions are actually very much alive and well today and that they very much continue to shape uh, our arguments about the kinds of things we do, the kinds of things we think are good, and the kinds of decisions we make in our lives. So if we think of these two factions as the abstain faction, right, the holy faction, we don't want to eat the meat, or the partake faction, the freedom faction. We can do what we want because we have faith, then no, these things aren't, aren't real and aren't going to really harm us. <clears throat> Those two factions, right, modern day, plenty of places where we can point to and we can see um, uh, those two kind of decision-making frameworks. So let me just talk real quick about a couple of 
a couple of ad campaigns. When I was a kid in elementary school, I participated in something called D.A.R.E. This was probably phased out by the time you were in elementary school, but maybe you had something similar. D.A.R.E. was our, uh, our education program about drugs and drug abuse. And Officer Bob from the local police department came in and told us that we shouldn't do drugs and drugs were bad and uh, drugs would do bad things to our brains. And uh, what we should do is we should just say no to drugs, right? And this came out of um, a campaign uh, that was spearheaded by First Lady Nancy Reagan, who's the, the woman you see there at the, in the slide at the center bottom of your uh, screen. Uh, Nancy Reagan is the First Lady uh, married to President Ronald Reagan. Uh, in the 80s. And she spearheaded this just say no to drugs campaign. Uh, there was concern about growing rates of addiction, particularly among uh, youth and young adults. And so uh, the first lady led this campaign to, to educate kids that they could say no to drugs. And they could dare to resist drugs, right? Um, so pretty simple, just say no, right? Abstain. Something is dangerous, potentially bad for you, just say no to it. Interestingly, um, there is some evidence to suggest that the just say no campaign and the dare education model didn't work very well. There's actually been some studies that indicate that uh, students that did dare uh, when they were in elementary school were actually more likely to end up trying drugs than students who hadn't done DARE. Uh, there's also people who, who criticize that data and say it's not actually representative. Um, so there's some conflict about it. But overall, what a lot of experts in the area of drug addiction and substance abuse have come to say is that you, know, like you can tell people to just say no, but actually things are pretty complex, right? And so we need more than just an abstinence approach to educating people at drugs about drugs. We also have to have uh, recovery programs, and we have to have some science and some medical models that come in. Uh, we have to look at like the reasons people end up uh, uh, finding uh, uh, themselves their way into drugs rather than, you know, other things that might be healthier for them. So there's a complexity there. And so there's some critiques out there of this abstinence, just say no model that say, well, it's a bit more complicated. Than that. Okay, so that's one example. That's from when I was a kid. More recently, 2014, Bud Light. Do you all know, you don't know what Bud Light is, surely. Um, uh, Bud Light is a, it's a beverage. Uh, it purports to be a beer. Um, I, I'm still waiting for Snopes to, to say if that's true or not. But anyway, Bud Light claims to be a beer. And they came up with this uh, ad slogan that was hashtag up for whatever. And you might've even seen like some of the Super Bowl commercials and people would drink a Bud Light and that they would be swept off into this amazing adventure that um, where they were up for whatever and, and whatever happened was great and there was a huge party. I think Bud Light even converted a small town in Colorado into like whatever land where there was like massive inflatables and all sorts of like fun stuff going on. So up for whatever, right? You are, you're excited for whatever's gonna happen tonight. Well, the Bud Light ad campaign got themselves into some hot water. Um, part of their campaign was a slogan that said, hashtag up for whatever, the perfect beer for removing no from your vocabulary for the night. And this got immediate pushback, right? This slogan evoked connections between alcohol and alcohol use and sexual assault. Uh, the idea of removing no from your vocabulary for the night, right? is in direct contradiction to efforts to educate people about the importance of consent, the importance of the ability to say no, and the importance of, the, of, of, of hearing somebody say yes, right? I've actually got my, you can't quite see it, but this is my uh, April Sexual Assault Awareness Month pin on um, from the Health Center, right? That th <clears throat> this ad slogan um, seemed to be uh, working against efforts by community groups to educate people around consent and sexual assault awareness. So there's problems with the abstinence only framework. It doesn't hold the complexity of the issue. And there's these problems with the up for whatever framework. It uh, uh, belies the fact that actually being up for whatever can get us into some harmful territory and some, uh, some territory of allowing for things that people actually should not be up for, that we should be speaking out against. So the question becomes, are these really the only two decision-making frameworks that we have. Do we really have to either abstain, just say no, 
or believe that we can be, we're, we're up for whatever and whatever comes our way, we say yes to. Well, of course, these are not the only two decision-making frameworks. And in fact, I would call these pre-ethical frameworks because they don't actually have the depth of discernment of, tradition, of actual ethical approaches. Um, traditionally, and I would go way more into this if we were in an ethics class, right? Traditionally, um, ethicists and philosophers have just divided the ethical uh, tradition into three broad categories, deontological, which means rules-based ethics, consequentialist or, um, or utilitarian, which means effects, like what the, doing the most good or the least harm is what makes for ethical decisions, or, or a virtue model, which is about what kind of person do I want to become and what are the behaviors that make me that kind of person, a good person or a moral person or a joyful person. But all of these frameworks are ways of thinking very deeply to discern and to make ethical decisions in a world of complexity where it's not always clear what the right decision is. In other words, there's deep philosophical frameworks that challenge the idea that the world is just divided into people who say, just say no, and people who say, I'm up for whatever, right? And so Paul, responding to the church in Corinth, is trying to find a deeper, more grounded ethical framework uh, for these decisions that they are trying to make. And what he actually ends up doing is making a case for a richer and deeper understanding of what freedom actually is. So here's Paul a couple chapters later, still addressing that same issue in Corinth. And this passage, I would argue, really reveals Paul's account of freedom. Paul starts by quoting the Corinthians in their own words again. All things are lawful. That's their statement. And then he says, but not all things are beneficial. All things are lawful, he says, but not all things build up. Don't seek your own advantage, but that of the other. Eat whatever is sold in the meat market without raising any question on the ground of conscience for the earth and its fullness are the Lord's. If a neighbor, an unbeliever, right, somebody who's not part of the community invites you to a meal and you're disposed to go, eat whatever is set before you without raising any question on the ground of conscience. But if someone says to you, this has been offered in sacrifice, then do not eat it. Out of consideration for the one who informed you and for the sake of conscience, I mean the other's conscience, not your own. For why should my liberty, my freedom, right, be the subject to the judgment of someone else's conscience? Why should my freedom be constrained by somebody else's belief? I'm free, Paul says. If I partake with thankfulness, if I'm grateful, why should I be denounced? Why should I be criticized for what I'm grateful to eat or to drink? So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do everything for the glory of God. Give no offense to Jews or to Greeks or to the church of God. By the way, for Paul, that's everyone. That's like the whole world or in one of those categories. Just as I try to please everyone in everything I do, not seeking my own advantage, but that of many or of the all, so that they may be saved. So this is Paul's account of freedom, right? Um, Paul says, yes, you are free, right? Remember, he says, all things are lawful. He doesn't necessarily disagree with that. He says, why should my liberty, my freedom, be subject to the judgment of, some, of someone else's conscience? So he says, yeah, you're free. Freedom is really important. But freedom isn't just about what's good for me. It's about what's beneficial, what's good, what builds up the community. And the community's witness to the world, the way that we relate to our neighbor, right? We say the neighbor who invites us over to dinner. So Paul says, yeah, you're free. Yeah. You're free, but your freedom isn't an individualistic freedom. That's about you being able to do whatever you want, being up for whatever, right? Your freedom is about your freedom to make the community better, to build the community up, to make its witness to the world more uh, effective and more loving and more powerful. So Paul cares a lot about freedom, and he doesn't, as it turns out, have a legalistic framework. Uh, in fact, he's very suspicious of the idea of abstaining being a law for everyone. Instead, what Paul is promoting here is what I would call a stewardship framework of freedom. And it's based in the theology of creation. Let me show you something here in the passage real quick. Uh, 
These quotes are quotes from the letter that the Corinthian church has written to Paul. All things are lawful, they wrote. But this quote is actually something else. This quote, the earth and its fullness are the Lord's, is not from that letter. Uh, it's a quote from the Bible. Now remember, Paul is Jewish, right? Just like Jesus is Jewish, all the early disciples were Jew Jewish. So this is a quote from the Jewish scriptures, from the Psalms, in fact. The earth is the Lord and all that is in it is the, the modern translation of the quote from Psalm 24. So what Paul is saying here is, look, everything that's made was made by God. It was made by God and it was called good. And so you can engage in that creation and all of that creation and anything you might eat or drink or interact with. It's all good. It's all beautiful. It's all made by God. But we are called to be stewards of that creation. Now, steward sounds like a fancy Bible word, but it just means caretaker. It means somebody who takes care of something that they don't really own. The earth, all of creation, it's all God's. It was all made by God. We're called to take care of it. And so we're free, right? Because it's all good. The world isn't made up of these things that are scary that we have to say no to, but we do have to have some discernment and some stewardship and some care uh, for that world. And that's, that's Paul's really deep account of freedom. Freedom for Paul is not about what I am allowed to do, um, but rather what I am able to do for the good of the community and for the good of the world. It actually reminds me, uh, now that we're on this slide, of a quote from RuPaul. Uh, RuPaul, in a recent interview, uh, was asked about like why she cares about drag. Like why has she mainstreamed what used to be a very marginalized uh, thing? Uh, drag with things like RuPaul's Drag Race and these, these popular television shows. And she said, well, we're all just God in drag. And she goes on to say what she means by that is we're all part of this kind of divine reality created by God, is, is what Paul would say, right? And, and that, uh, um, that the outward stuff we do, the outward performance, is just a way of expressing that inward reality of divinity or of createdness. Well, Paul is saying a similar thing. He's saying like, look, you're getting all caught up in whether to eat the meat or not to eat the meat. But actually it's all good. It's all God. But we've got to then make some choices about the performance and, the, and how, how that relates to others and how that helps or hurts others. So, so freedom is core to Paul's theology. Remember, Paul is Jewish. Jesus and the 12 disciples are Jewish. So the Jewish scriptures are really important to them. The narrative of Exodus, freedom from slavery in Egypt. That's the foundational stuff of faith for these folks. And Judaism and Christianity in their more modern forms both take accounts of freedom with a life and death seriousness. That's why you see faith leaders involved in movements like the civil rights movement, movements for freedom and for liberty and for rights. Uh, and I just have a, a picture there in the corner of a rabbi leading a prayer at the Department of Justice in Washington, D.C. Uh, during a Poor People's Campaign march a few summers ago. Uh, the Poor People's Campaign was the campaign Martin Luther King Jr., the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., right? He was a pastor. Uh, it was the campaign he was working on when he was killed. And 50 years later, it was relaunched and reinvigorated by a Disciples of Christ clergy person from this great state of North Carolina, in fact, the Reverend Dr. William Barber II relaunched the Poor People's Campaign as an interfaith movement. And here you see um, a rabbi leading a prayer as part of that faith movement. So these religious traditions still care very much about freedom and about liberty and about working to make sure that everybody has access to the freedoms and the rights guaranteed to them by their divine creativeness. Freedom is core for Paul. Okay? In fact, in a different letter, his letter to the Galatians, Paul writes, for freedom, Christ has set us free. In other words, we've been set free in order that we can be free, right? Freedom is, is what we're here for. He says, you are called to freedom, brothers and sisters. Only don't use your freedom as an opportunity for self-indulgence. It's not about me. It's not about up for whatever. But through love, become slaves or servants to one another. For the whole law is summed up in a single commandment. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. This is what freedom is about for Paul. It's the freedom to love. It's the freedom to care for each other. It's the freedom to lift each other up. And so our decisions about whether we eat or drink, the kind of ethical decisions that we make all have to come from that place. We can't start with, 
uh, the this or that, the up for whatever, or the just say no, we have to have a deeper account and understanding of creation and of freedom. I wanted to end just uh, by <clears throat> playing a quick song for you all. And uh, this is a song from the Poor People's Campaign that I told you about. Um, and it's, it's everybody's got a right to live. And this I think is a, a modern example of the kind of holistic understanding of freedom that Paul is talking about in his letter to the Corinthians. Oops, and I didn't play the movie. Because this campaign is paying homage to the old and the new, we think about the then and the now of a movement. Um, we're bridging the gap between 1968 and 2018, which is 50 years of just revolution and 50 years of activism. Um, so we also incorporated a new part that incorporates um, hip hop, a little hip hop aspect to it. So to bring the old with the new. So when we get to that, we'll teach you how the words flow and go. So your words are first, everybody's got a right to live. And before this campaign fails, we'll all go down to jail. Because everybody has a right to live. You got that? That. All right. Um, and so then the second part uh, will be everybody's got a right to live, and then you all will say to live, and then everybody's got a right to love, to love. To love. Everybody's got a right to dream, to, to dream. dream. Everybody's got a right to learn, to, to learn. learn. Got it. All right. Yeah. All right. Here we go. And So this is what Paul says, right, in different words. Yeah, I've got a right. Yeah, I've got freedom. But everybody's got a right to live, to love, to be a part of this beloved community. This is the thick account of freedom that Paul gives us. I've got some discussion questions that are here for you. Don't feel like you have to engage in all of these. Uh, pick one or one cluster that kind of speaks to you. Uh, one is about like your initial impressions of Paul and whether this lecture changed those at all. Uh, another is about how you see these kind of two frameworks up for whatever, just say no, playing out in the Barton community or your home community or your faith community. Another is like, you probably haven't thought about meat sacrifice to idols a lot, but are there other controversial issues that you see this um, this discussion may be relating to. So I hope this has been interesting and intriguing for you. Um, again, just putting my uh, contact information up if you want to talk to me more about anything. My website's there if you're kind of interested in some of these ideas and you want to check out some of the other stuff I write and record and things like that. And then of course, we're doing these remote prayers all the time during the remote learning uh, Tuesdays at 11 a.m. And Thursdays at 8 p.m. So check your emails if you're interested in participating in that. I'd love to have you. Um, everybody's got a right to live. You've got a right to live. You're essential. I've got a right to live. I'm essential. This is the account of freedom that Paul calls us to. And so I hope that wherever you are watching this, this finds you in good health and in good spirits. And just please know that uh, we love you and we miss you and that I am praying for you to have blessings of peace and health and assurance uh, during this time. Thanks, you all. Peace and God bless.